First of all, can we just go ahead and get a round of applause for Trevor for reading that chapter in the dark? <laughs> I gave him Judges 15, and, and uh, if I'd have told him that he was going to have to read that in the dark, he might not have come to church tonight. All right, Garrett and I were sitting in the back of the room, and we're just like, oh, I'm so sorry, brother. Uh, but anyway, we're doing some power outage preaching tonight. Good job, brother. Um, as long as you just read them like you, you know it, you think it sounds that way, no one will second guess you. That's what I try to do anyway. But anyway, we're looking uh, tonight, we're doing some power outage preaching. Um, I like how some of you are looking at me like this is my fault. I have nothing to do with this, all right? But I'm going to try to um, try to get us to the barbecue as soon as we possibly can. But what are we looking at tonight? We're looking at Caleb as a father. And tonight we're going to look at Caleb part two. All right, we're going to look at Caleb part two. We're going to look at another aspect of Caleb as a father. We're going to look at another example um, along with Caleb, along the same lines of something that Caleb does. And just, uh, just a note um, tonight, I'm going to veer into my opinion a little bit, but there is some biblical examples that match how I feel in this area. Um, so I'm sure, um, so I, anyway, I just want to point that out, that a lot of this will be, some of this will be my personal opinion, how I apply um, what these men did to being a father in my life. And you can kind of take that for what it is. But I'm just careful to point out like what my opinion is and what you know the Bible actually says is doctrine. Some of this will be my opinion, and I'll point out what that is. All right. Look at Joshua chapter 15. It'd be really cool if like the like the, the most at the crescendo of the sermon, if like the power just came back on and the lights can you know, but that probably won't happen. But anyway, Joshua chapter 15. Let's look at another um, situation that happens with Caleb. Um, as a father, Caleb with his daughter. If you remember from this morning, we looked at the strength of Caleb. We looked at the strength of Caleb, how that applies um, to setting the bar for our children, the strength of a father. We looked at what Caleb did to ensure that his daughter had a strong man um, to marry as he you know, demanded or you know, put this challenge forth that whoever takes this city um, will you know, have the privilege of marrying my daughter, all right? He's guaranteeing that his daughter marry, marry somebody that is worthy that's going to take care of her. But look at verse number 18. After this happens, Joshua 15, look at verse number 18. It says, it came to pass as she came unto him. This is his daughter. Um, she's married now, all right? So she's been married um, to this man that took the city. That she moved to ask, that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, what wouldest thou? So his daughter comes to him, and he basically says, what can I do for you? What do you want? Who answered, give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Turn to Judges chapter 1, and we see another um, explanation or another verse um, you know, showing us this same event. If you go to Judges chapter 1 and look at verse number 15, so you see Judges chapter 1, verse number 15, the Bible says, And she came and she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. So what do we see happening here? We see his daughter has married this man that took the city that Caleb, you know, put forth as a challenge. And now she comes to her father. She's a married woman at this point. And she comes to her father and she asks for this blessing. She asks for a piece of land. So she's already gotten um, some land. And her father, you know, she asked her father for springs of water. She asked her father for land that had, I mean, she's asking her father for good land. Land that has, you know, springs and water. And obviously they're looking at, you know, raising animals or having some sort of business on this land. And she wants this good land. But Caleb, what does he do? She gives her what she asks. He supports her in these needs, even after she is married. So he is supporting her even after she is married. And you say, well, doesn't she have a husband for that? I mean, what is, uh, what is he doing here? He, he's obviously a very capable husband, you know, this man that she has married. But let me give you another example of this. And look at second, uh, actually go to First Chronicles chapter number 22. Go to First Chronicles chapter number 22. So she goes to her father who has already given her, you know, a lot. And she asks for this good piece of land and he gives it to her even after she is married. But look, 
Let me show you another example of this. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, we see the story of David, and he is dealing with his son Solomon. And if you remember, David was ordered not to build the temple by Nathan. And he explains to Solomon here that, you know, the reasons why he, God did not want him to build the temple, and that was to fall to Solomon. All right, but look at what happens in First Chronicles chapter number 22. Let's start down at verse number 7. So we're looking at these fathers. We looked at Caleb, and he's supporting his daughter even as she heads into her married life. Look at verse number 7. And David said to Solomon, his son, he says, My son... As for me, it was in my mind to build a house under the name of the Lord my God. Remember, David went to Nathan, and he wanted to build the house of God. And, you know, at first, Nathan was like, hey, sounds good. But then God said no. God said that he did not want David to build the temple. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about for his name shall be Solomon and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. Remember Solomon ruled 40 years as well. And he shall build an house for my name and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne in his kingdom over Israel forever. Of course, David's throne over Israel was established forever. That's the messianic promise to David. So thus, since Solomon is David's son, his throne will be established forever through the same means, which is Jesus Christ, as David's throne was, because it's the same throne. All right. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee and prosper thou and build the house of the Lord thy God as he hath said of thee. So David is telling Solomon, the charge to build the, sem the temple is yours. I've shed too much blood. God said he doesn't want me to do it. He wants you to do it. Now look at verse number 12. But that is not all that David does. All right, David just doesn't say, have a good time, build the temple. I was too bloody. I was at war the whole time. So God said, no, look at verse number 12. Only the Lord gave thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel, and thou mayest, and th that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Look at verse number 12 and verse number 13. What is he doing here? Then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses con with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. What is he doing? He's giving godly counsel to his son. He is supporting his son through godly counsel. He's like, look, I know God has given you wisdom. I know God has given you, you know, understanding, but you need to follow the Lord. You need to follow the word of the Lord. Now look at verse number 14. He does not stop there. He gives him godly counsel. He tells him to keep his nose in his Bible, keep his Christian walk in order. And then look at verse number 14. Now behold, in my trouble, I have prepared for the house of the Lord and hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight, for it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared that thou mayest add thereto. What has he done here? He has not only told Solomon that, yes, this is your charge in your life. He has not only given him godly counsel, but he has literally laid up monetary support and supplies for him to carry out this mission. Look at verse number 15. Moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance, hewers and workers of stone and timber, and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. Of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron, there is no number. Arise, therefore, and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. David also commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, is not the Lord your God with you, and hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. What does he do? He not only gives him the materials. And look, can you talk, I mean, you want to talk about expensive building materials? The building materials were gold yeah. and, and silver and just piles of precious metals that they were to make the temple and everything inside the temple out of. If you read the temple, everything's coated in gold. This is gold. The walls, everything is gold and silver. He lays all of this up 
for his son. But not only that, after this, he uses his connections and he uses his power to make sure that he has all the help that he needs, that he has all the labor that he needs, that he has all the political support that he needs. He goes to all these princes and he's like, hey, you have the land because I spent my life at war for you. Now help my son build the house of the Lord. Look at verse 19. It says, now set your heart and soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build you the sanctuary of the Lord your God. Look, just as Aksa's husband he had a job to provide for her, Caleb's daughter's husband, to, to build the ranch and to build the business. And in this same manner, it was Solomon's job to build the temple. It was his job alone. But look, David, his father, and this is the whole point of the sermon. Caleb and David, they set these kids up for success. They set themselves, they set these kids up and they provided the, and here's the key word for the sermon tonight, they provided the support that those kids needed to succeed. In every way. In every way. From, from godly counsel to project needs to, you know, just the, the land that, that they needed to do whatever it is that they were going to do. I mean, all these things, I mean, just think of the labor. Somebody had to do the work. Just think of the skilled labor, the cunning men, the Bible says, that were needed. We'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. But you have to ask yourself, why did David do this? Why did Caleb do this? And the answer is because a good father with strength, as we talked about this morning, will use that strength as long as he can to help his children be successful. Amen. That is the answer. So, I mean, the title, if the sermon had a title, it would be the, the support of a father. The support of a father. And that's what you see Caleb do, and that's what you see David do with Solomon. Now, ask yourself a question. Does every, do you think everyone has the same chances at success in this world? Absolutely not. Everyone does not have the same chance at success. Do you think Solomon would have been more likely to succeed or less likely to succeed if David had done nothing and just said, hey, your job, yeah, I was too, I was at war, it's just your job. Would Solomon have still done it? Possibly, probably, but David did everything he could short of building it himself to make sure that his son was successful. And it's important to note, and the first point I want to make tonight, and I'm going to apply this, I'm going to apply this to how I think of this as a father tonight, but it's important to note that both of these men, both of these men were not laying up an inheritance for their kids when they passed away. Yeah. Yeah. They were not laying up an inheritance for their kids. So when David died and Solomon was 80, that then he would have an inheritance. I've always been a little confused about that, to be honest with you. Yeah. I've always been a little confused because I've seen so many people in my life, like, you know, maybe they don't have a great relationship with their parents and they're just like, you know, they're just waiting for a certain person to pass away so they can inherit everything that that person had. Or somebody is, you know, waiting to inherit a large piece of land or something. But they're waiting until they're like 75, 80 years old because people live a long time. I mean, thank God people live a long time. But it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. What these men were doing is they were providing a start for their children. Right. They were supporting their children in a start and that is what a godly father will do is he will be a support and a start for his children i mean the perfect example of this is just the christian life it's just a father showing his children how to walk their own christian life because your children may be two three four years old right now but eventually you better start being concerned about them starting to walk their christian life on their own and that is what a father, that is an important aspect of a father's faith. That's an important aspect of the strength of a father's faith. Every time a father comes to church and brings his family to church, 
he is either and look i hate to rain on your parade here you know in the dark tonight all right but every time a father brings his his children to church he is supporting them getting on their feet Amen. in their christian life Amen. but every time he doesn't he's breaking it down mm-hmm. there's really no middle ground Amen. there's no cruise control Amen. in this christian life it's either forward or backward every single time You know, a father is at home living the Christian life that his children are learning at church and through their own Bible reading. Here's the thing with these kids, folks. They live with you. You know, you can go and you can put on a face at church and you can maybe think that you're going to be someone that you're not really not. You know, you're going to have a mess at home and you can look like a perfect person at church. Not to your kids, though. It's not going to work because your kids are going to know who you are. They live there with you all the time. So every single time you are at home in your life, going to work, they're seeing how you treat your wife, they're seeing how you treat the children, you're seeing how you act in your Christian life, they're seeing the the steps you actually take, you are either supporting their Christian walk or you're breaking it down. One of those two things. Turn to 3 John chapter one. I love this verse in the Bible for fathers. But it's all about supporting and providing that start for your children. Look at 3 John chapter number 1. 3 John chapter number 1. Look at verse number 4. Now, I understand that John here is talking about his spiritual children. But this is such a great verse for a father as well. This is a great verse for a father and just seeing his children walk on their own seeing his children get that that start in their life he supported that start now their children are having their own christian walk look i'm telling you it is a great thing to see your children start walking on their own spiritually it is a wonderful thing to see look at third john or third john chapter one verse number four look what john says he says i have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth you know what he's saying? He's, he's referencing this spiritual family, these spiritual children that he has, and he's writing them a letter. But you know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm not there. I'm not there to be like showing you every little thing, and you're walking in truth on your own. And let me tell you something. That is true. When you see your children grow up and walk on their own in their spiritual life with their faith, there is no greater joy than that. There's no greater joy than seeing that. And those of you that have older children that are also doing that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that joy. But look, providing a start, providing that godly example through the strength of your faith is going to give your children that support that they need so they can have that walk on their own. But guess what? Guess what? And this is where, you know, I'm going to kind of apply, you know, my application to what David and Caleb did here. But here's another thing. You have to understand that these men, they they provided material support for their children. These men provided material support. You know, I bet not everyone's dad gave them a field with springs in it. Like, that's not fair. You're right. That's not fair at all. Life isn't fair. Not everybody has a dad like Caleb that is just going to give his child, that his child, that family, that new family that just started out, just give them this great, wonderful, productive piece of land so they can just start, you know, they can just start hitting the ground running in their early married life. Look, that's an advantage. That's an advantage over those who did not have a father like Caleb that gave them those things. It's a definite advantage. I mean, it's an advantage for somebody who didn't have to go out and work for 15 years to buy a piece of land like the one Caleb just gave to her. It's a huge advantage. Or maybe there's people that could just never afford that that field of, of springs that Caleb gave his daughter. But look, I believe that a parent should plan for a financial start, that a father who is the provider should plan for a financial start for his children. That's what I believe. That's an application that I take from this, and that's something that I live in my life. I believe that, you know, money should be put aside for for your children, and support should be put aside to give your children a start, because guess what? That's when they need it, when they're starting. That's when they need that advantage, that boost. And guess what? The time to think about this is when your kids are two. 
when your kids are three. Right? That's what these guys did. I believe that you should teach part of your homeschooling, your education that you give to your children should be some, some financial sense that you give them Amen. on how to handle their life, things to do in their life, how to save their money, how to not waste everything. I've said to my kids a thousand times, you know, and I always I like make lessons whenever we're at and wherever we are. We're buying stuff at Home Depot or whatever. And I've told um, Garrett since he was this tall, like as soon as he could understand what I was saying, like it doesn't matter how much money you make, you can spend it all. You can go out and buy stupid stuff that you don't need, and you can just, oh, I just need to make more money, people think, and they just waste all their money. We should give our kids some financial sense. And you know what? That is support that will support them through their entire life and will get them on their feet and, and get them moving in this life. I mean, another thing I've said to my kids over and over again, if you have savings, you have options. If you have debt, you're in servitude. That's just Bible right there. And then whenever my kids have savings and they use that savings for something, I say it again. Like, you have savings? What, do you, what did you have here? Options, Dad. But that is something that needs to be passed on, and that is really important support that a father needs to provide for his children. All these things, look, they're looked at as negative today. All these things are looked at, you know what they call it today? Oh yeah, his daddy helped him out, or you know, it's you know, daddy's money or whatever it is. And you know, maybe their a parent paid for school, maybe a father paid off a bill, whatever. You know what they call that today? It's a bad word today. It's called they call it privilege today. Oh, you're privileged today. No, you just had a father that was doing what he was supposed to do. Yep. You said a father that had some sense and decided that he wanted to support his kids, you know, getting up on their feet. That's all. You see it in the Bible. You know, the miss here is people say, oh, you know, that's privilege. Those are things that you didn't earn. You know, the miss is, though, is that, you know, that father earned those things. He earned those things and he's using those things. David earned those things. David built that kingdom. David fought those battles, and he was using his life of work and labor and war to support the next generation. You know what? And I want my kids to have that privilege. Look, I'm not talking about spoiling your kids. Right. I'm not talking about, you know, just giving handouts to your children. They need to learn to work hard and support themselves and support their families. But guess what? You know, they need to have, they need to see this attitude of a father being supportive. Why? So they can support their kids. They can pass it on to their kids. I'm not embarrassed of the privilege of having a strong father. I had a strong father that was supportive of me. I'm not embarrassed of that. I want to pass it on to my kids. I want to pass the character traits that my dad passed on to me. I want to pass that on to my kids. It's something as fathers that we are to provide. And that's what you see Caleb and, do, and, and, uh, and David doing here. Look. We should provide a start. And that's what Caleb and David did. So, you know, I want to be there for my kids until I'm 85, until I'm 86, 87, however long it is, I want to be that hedge of protection, that support for my kids. All right? Look, there's, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter number 2. And guess what? It's not just money either. It's not just money either. It's not just faith either. I mean, this is what kids with young families, you know, I mean, they're just getting married. They're starting out, you know, that's why the inheritance after death is such a weird thing. I'm not saying, like, I'm not going to, you know, that don't worry, kids. I mean, hopefully you'll still inherit a dollar or two. But, I mean, the point is, like, you need the help at the beginning. Yeah, right. That's when you're broke. That's when you make no money. They need the help at the beginning. And this is exactly what we're seeing in these stories. But look at Second Chronicles chapter 2. There's something else here that was given by fathers besides, you know, just godly counsel, besides monetary things. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Still talking about the construction of the temple. Still talking about this very important construction project. This is David's friend. David's friend, the king of Tyre. So again, we see David's connections paying off. For Solomon, but now David's friend, this king, is talking to Solomon. Look at verse number 13. And now I have sent a cunning man 
This isn't just cunning men. This is the cunning man right here. Endued with understanding of Hiram, my father's, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. So now we're describing this cunning man. This is the cunning man. This is the, the, the foreman, the superintendent, the project manager of the temple job. All right. This is the guy that knows how to do everything. All right. But look at how he is described. All right. It's this man. He's a son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. And his father was a man of Tyre, skillful. We're not talking about this kid. We're talking about what his father could do. Do you notice that? He's not talking about what the kid can do. He's describing what his father could do. Skillful to work in gold and silver and brass and iron and stone and in timber and purple and blue and in fine linen and in crimson also to grave any manner of graving and to find out every device which shall be put to him. He could figure out anything. He could figure out any machine. He could figure out any tool with thy cunning men and with the cunning men of my Lord David, thy father. So this father right here, see, first of all, this cunning man, the cunning man that's going to run all the other cunning men, his father prepared his son. The only reason he exists is because this father prepared his son for the world. He provided him a path to be able to do all of the things just listed. The reason it lists what his father was able to do is because it is assumed that because his father could do these things, that he is also good or better at all of these things. And that's why he's describing this man's father, that he's going to basically rule over. He's going to, he's going to show your cunning men what to do. So the first father here that we see, so we've got David, Solomon's father, We've got the king of Tyre. We've got Caleb that we're talking about. But we've got the father of the cunning man. He supported the temple project as well by teaching his son how to do all these things, by teaching his son to be the cunning man. This father supported the project through teaching his son. That's how he supported it. Planning, skills. His father taught all of it to him. Solomon, see, Solomon really didn't need money. He had a lot of money. He didn't really need wealth. God gave him wealth. But it was the plans, it was the people, it was the connections that David provided him that really got him, you know, I mean, really, when you think about it, it was the fathers that built the temple. <laughs> when you think about it, it was the cunning man's father, and it was Solomon's father that set these men up for success. And that is a great example that we need to take away as fathers. We need to set our kids up for success in this life. That's a responsibility that we have as fathers. Look, if you're a good father, that's what you should want to do is set your, your kids up for that advantage, for that privilege. Look, a father's role defines everything for his children. I mean, it's it defines the successes in nearly every area of the child's life is what I'm trying to get you to see from this morning and this evening. I mean, we looked at the, he sets the bar for his sons. He sets the bar for his daughters. But throughout his entire children's life, he should support them. And this is the attitude that I take as a father. Look, it's not like my kids are going to get married and just be like, okay, I'm out. Peace out. I want to support them. I want to be there for them whenever they need me as long as I possibly can be. Amen. 100%. Well, and guess what? It is a major advantage. And I'm glad that they have it for as long as I can provide it. It's a major... I mean, having a father to support you along the way, those of you that have had that, it is a huge advantage in life. It's not to take the place of your own hard work. It's not to take the place of your own Christian walk. It's not to take the place of your role as a husband, as your role as a wife, as your role, you know, as a, as a leader of your own family. It's not to take the place of that. It's simply a hedge of protection for your children in their life. And look, I want to be all that for my children for as long as possible. And that's what I see these men doing in the Bible. But guess what? That means, that means that as a father, 
And I've, I've felt this many times as a father, but that means that as a father, there's no break. There's no break from that. There's no, like, I want to relax now and, you know, be an idiot for a while. I want to just, you know, drop my Christian life for a while. Kids are out of the house. I'm going to just be, I'm just going to be a fool for a year or whatever. No, it's how I live my life, how I live my faith, what I do today that either supports or breaks down my children for as long as I'm around. I wonder if people would have thought about that and the responsibilities and how long these responsibilities last. You know, when they first had kids. Look, how I do things today, how you do things today and every day of your life literally defines how well of a support you will be for your children. And Caleb and David were a great example. What I do now matters, whether my kids are married or not. What I do now matters, whatever stage of life my children are in. Now, for the children, for the children, uh, you know, of fathers like this, you need to appreciate this advantage if you have it. You know what? Don't you be ashamed of this advantage. Don't you stick up your nose at people that don't have the advantage. But today, you're being taught to be ashamed of this advantage of having a biblical father that supports you. You're being taught that you need to hang your head low. There's all kinds of exercises that you hear companies doing now where it's like, oh, if if you grew up in a home with two parents that didn't get divorced and you grew up with a dad that did this for you and this for you, take one step forward and all this. And they're trying to get you to see like all the advantage that you have over somebody that didn't have those things so you can feel bad and, you know, like quit your job and give it to somebody else or something. I I don't know what, what the point is, but they're trying to shame privilege. And it's not about spoiling your kids, but privilege is simply what will happen if a father follows the Bible. His his children will be privileged. His children will be protected. His children will have great strength. His children will be supported. His children will have peace in their life. They'll have an advantage that other people have. So look, kids, if you have it, you need to appreciate it. Don't be proud And don't taunt it. it, You know, understand that not everybody has it, but you can personally appreciate it. And, you know, tell your dad, tell your father that you do appreciate it. And just let me say this before we close tonight. If you don't have it, if you never had that advantage, if you never had, you know, a dad that, you know, gave you this advantage, if you never had a dad that supported you and showed you, you know, what the strength of faith of his faith was and never had a, you didn't grow up in a Christian home and you didn't have a dad that showed you work ethic and you didn't have a dad that supported you and showed you skills and showed you all these things like the cunning man's dad. If you didn't have that, look, don't resent it. Reinstate it. Amen. Start it in the next generation Amen. of your life. We've had several young men in this church in the past years that were in this church that did not have this. They had nothing close. As a matter of fact, some of them had the opposite of this. They had terrible examples for fathers. And, you know, all you have to do if that is you, all you have to do, if if that was me, I would find a biblical church, I would find a good pastor, I would get in that church as much as I possibly could, I would grow spiritually strong, I would ask a ton of questions, and I would do every single thing that man told me to do. And guess what? You can make it too. You can have the same advantage. Because God gave you pastors and teachers. God provides a, a hedge of protection for people that didn't even have this great earthly father like we're seeing in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse number 21. Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse number 21. And then going forward, when you, when you follow the Bible and implement the Bible for your family and your children, going forward, that advantage will be had by your kids. And they can have that advantage. In just one generation, you could turn all of that around. So it doesn't even really matter if you didn't have the advantage because you still have the word of God. 
You still have the Bible. Look at Matthew 19, verse number 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. Of course, he's talking um, to a young man there that is not really going to do that. But the point is, you have treasures in heaven. Everybody who's saved is going to have treasures in heaven. In John 14, too, he says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. So your heavenly father is laying up treasures in heaven for you, even if you didn't have a father on earth that was doing the same. We all have a heavenly father. Amen. And he blesses, he not only blesses us here, but he lays up treasures for us in eternity. And guess what, though? We have that spiritual guidance here in the Bible. We have that spiritual guidance here. God just doesn't leave us hanging if our, our earthly fathers didn't do what they were supposed to do. Turn to Psalm chapter 68 and look at verse number five. Psalm chapter 68, look at verse number five. This is a great verse describing our heavenly father. In Psalm chapter 68 and verse number five, the Bible says this. It says, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Everybody has God for their father. If you're saved, God is your father. God has adopted you into his family. He gives you his godly counsel. He will support you through whatever you go through. And he's laying up treasures for you. He's laying up that inheritance for you in heaven. So just to wrap up these two sermons, you know, tonight, basically Caleb was a great example, kind of an overlooked character in the Bible. He's a great example of spiritual strength, physical strength, and, you know, just mental fortitude in the Bible. And that will set the bar for your children. Showing and walking your faith will set a high bar for your sons on what a man should be. It will set a high bar for your daughters on what kind of man she should look for. And then, of course, I believe that these men also showed us that we should support our children. And I am going to support my children. I support my children through planning for them, for their life. I don't just tell my children, like, hey, you know, you need to separate from all these things in your life. Here's what the Bible says that you should be part of, you shouldn't be part of. You know, we're not going to go off to a wicked university and then just give them no plan. Right. And just give them no path forward. No, I want to lay out a path forward for my children. And I want to also put things in place where that path is possible for them. I want to remove obstacles. I want to walk them through that. I want to talk with them through these things as they're growing up and then help them execute that plan. Right. It's very simple. Good. And look, I mean, I don't care what my kids need help with. I love going over and just like being on my hands and knees, fixing broken sprinkler heads, whatever they need. I know it's not gold and silver, but I want to be someone that can support and help my children out as long as I possibly can. And guess what? How I live my life and how you live your life as a father, it matters. We're talking about a fitness competition coming up. You know what? People play that stuff down, but that stuff's important. Amen. That stuff's important. If I'm some, you know, big, unhealthy blob and my children need help with something, I'm sorry, but I mean, that's, you know, you know what am I going to do? I'm sorry, I can't help you because I can't climb a ladder. I'm sorry I can't help you because I get tired when I walk to the refrigerator. No, that's pitiful. I want to be a strong father for as long as God blesses me with that strength. And I want to use all the blessings God's given me to help bless and support my children throughout their lives. As long as possible. As long as God allows me to do that. So I believe those things are important. We're not talking about standing in front of the mirror, you know, like doing this stuff. We're just talking about living a healthy lifestyle so we can be not a drag on our children, but a help to the next generation. I think Caleb was a great example of a father. He was a strong man, and he used that strength for his children. David as well. David as well. He could have just taken that shot that God gave him that he wasn't going to be able to build the temple. He could have stomped his foot and just dumped it off on his, on his son, but he didn't. He's like, you know what? Whatever I can do to help, I'm going to do to help. What a great attitude as a father. Happy Father's Day. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer, and then we'll go out and we'll barbecue while we've got some, got some sunlight here.